after the program. Beyond that, as far as the actual structure of society, I'm afraid we require nothing less than a complete and total revision. And this is where the Venus Project again comes in. I'm going to run down five of uh, what I consider to be the central attributes required to move into a resource-based economy. One, we must move from a growth economy to a steady state economy. The cancerous consequences of the infinite growth paradigm must be stopped before it's too late. In the final analysis, given our technological ingenuity at this stage, we propose the absolute, absolute elimination of the monetary system itself. There's no reform possible to stop what the system is doing. The scarcity and waste we see around us is created by us, not some intrinsic process of nature or some Malthusian inherent tendency. The need of money is no longer relevant and is extremely detrimental, in fact. Second, we must move from a primitive, competitive, invention-oriented system, work system, to a collaborative system. Not only are all goods produced in our current society inherently inferior, by the way, due to the need to maintain a competitive cost basis in the marketplace, but the competitive system also generates massive amounts of corruption. Yes, I agree. The incentive to compete does produce some improved goods and services to a certain degree, but that positive is utterly overshadowed by the planned obsolescence, the inherent planned obsolescence, and the general environmental indifference generated by the necessity to stay ahead of someone else. As an aside, imagine for a moment if the top engineers of the major car companies, rather than competing, got together and decided to collaborate on making the best car possible at a given point in time. Imagine if we established an incentive system that pulls people together to create the best rather than compete and produce inherent inferiority. Think about that. An open source world where all lines come together and produce goods so everyone can benefit. Think about that, the progress would just be unbelievable. Not to mention it would save tremendous amounts of resources. For there'd be no longer a need to duplicate perpetually. You don't have two companies making the same thing anymore. It's a form of preservation if they work together. Third, we have to move from our piecemeal dispersed industrial methods to a central planned system of streamlined functionality. Is it me or is it absolutely insane that we import strawberries from Brazil or bananas from Ecuador or water from Fiji when all of these things could be produced locally? As Jacques Fresco will describe in regard to his city systems, everything is as self-contained as possible. As another example, consider the general route of production, from mining the materials, to creating the preliminary components, to assembling the components, to distribution. And there's a constant move of, uh, of transportation to go, to go from one place to another, wasting tremendous amounts of energy. Give that some thought for a moment. To think about if you streamlined all of the actions of society, think about how fluid things could be and what that actually means. Now, to extend this point, in a talk I did called uh, Where Are We Going, I described a ground-up global approach to a network organization, uh, which is, in fact, a resource-based economy. And I described why the parameters are what they are. I don't have time to go through all of it, uh, but let me give just a quick rundown of the reasoning for those that have never even considered any other social system outside of what we know today. Very simply, the Earth is a system and must be treated as such. There are resources all over the Earth, and therefore we must have a system that can monitor these global resources within a global technological infrastructure. Therefore, we have to have a feedback system, which has to be global in nature, coming from the carrying capacity of the Earth, which is the starting point of all industrial decisions. The first step in this, we do a full survey of the Earth's natural resources. You can't make intelligent decisions if you don't know what comprises the attributes of those decisions. We must first understand the full range and capacity of the earthly components in order to derive inference as to our capabilities. There are many natural resources to consider on the planet, but for now, I want to focus on energy again, since energy is essentially the fuel of society. This is a good focal point. So what do we do? We scan the Earth holistically. Yes, we scan the entire planet, listing all relevant energy locations and potentials. The potentials, of course, to clarify, are based in part on the state of technology. I don't want to go into all the technical attributes of harnessing and things like that. 
for example, solar technology has dramatic potential at this stage due to the advent of nanotechnology. Uh, we are seeing a possible exponential increase in this potential where really small solar panels can have up to 97, 98 percent efficiency in the, the radiation that they pull in. Moving on, so we have this raw data. What do we do? We just rate each resource based on its renewability, pollution, and all the factors that have to do with the act of extraction and everything that goes along with it. It becomes self-defining, based explicitly on the goal of sustainability and maximum efficiency. Those resources that have the most negative retroactions are given the least priority in utilization. For example, fossil fuels are no longer needed. They're not renewable. They pollute the environment. Given the tremendous power of geothermal, wind, wave, and solar combined, there is, again, no reason to burn fossil fuels at all. Once we realize this, we move to our third point, distribution and monitoring. Energy distribution and infrastructure projects would logically be formulated based on technological possibility and, naturally, proximity to sources. In other words, if you have wind energy being utilized in Asia, uh, it's not, not likely going to be delivered to Latin America. So distribution parameters would be self-evident based upon the technology and proximity practicality. Likewise, again, active resource monitoring done through Earth sensors would allow a constant awareness of our rates of use, the rates of depletion, the rates of renewal, or any other parameter relevant to know. This is pivotal for us to maintain what we can consider a balanced load economy. If the scarcity of any resource is going to occur, we will see it far in advance, and we can forecast it, and we can make proper actions to adjust accordingly before it becomes a very large problem. This idea, of course, is nothing new. You see this in your inkjet printer. Your printer has an ink level, comes up to tell you what you have. And just to show that uh, this isn't some bizarre idea that's impossible, Hewlett Packard just recently came out with what Amazingly, they called a central nervous system for Earth, which the first time I heard that sentence was actually out of the mouth of Jacques Fresco. And that's exactly what they're attempting to do in a limited sense. They're trying to develop a wireless sensoring system to acquire extremely high resolution seismic data on land. And uh, this is exactly the direction. It's funny with these things that have been talked about for a long time. People say, oh, that could never happen. And we see it begin to happen in small pockets, if you will. All we have to do is scale this out and expand it for the needs that we require. OK, so what do we have so far? We have the locations of our uh, energy resources. We have the outputs and potentials and distribution qualifiers based on strate strategic usage. You would survey the public to see what they wanted. Just as someone goes to a store, they say to themselves, well, I want this. They get what they need, and it becomes a statistical point. Therefore, it's a dynamic monitoring of the consumption rates. And finally, we have a system of active resource monitoring that reports the state of energy supplies, rates of usage, and other relevant trends. I know I'm moving very quickly with, quickly with this. If you want a more expanded expression of this point, uh, you can go online and watch the lecture, Where Are We Going? In other words, with this entire concept, we've created a system, a systems approach to energy management on the planet. The system is comprised of real-time data and statistics. The process of, of unfolding is based not on a person or group's opinion, not on the whims of a corporation or government, but on natural law and reasoning. In other words, once we establish the interest that survival and hence sustainability is our goal as a species, which I hope everyone here shares, each parameter to consider in regard to resource management becomes completely self-evident from the ground up. It's called arriving at decisions as opposed to making them, which is a subjective act based on incomplete information and very often cultural or personal biases. Using this energy model as a procedural example, and I'm going to start moving very quickly because I didn't realize how long this presentation was. It's already almost 5.30. We would compile this information into a computer database management program. And this will be the logical means to monitor and have automation systems to correct elements that are problematic. We want to eliminate the subjectivity currently dominant in our society. This is like a nervous system. There's no reason to vote on anything. There's no reason to debate anything in Congress. Moving on to point four. For the sake of humanity and efficiency, we need to stop wasting time on labor processes that are generated by the market system to maintain employment. We need to move into deliberate 
automation of everything we can. Given the current state of technology today, there is absolutely no reason for a waiter to exist in any restaurant. There is absolutely no reason for anyone to work at the post office. There is absolutely no reason why anyone should be in virtually any factory whatsoever. I've been working on a statistical data set for a project that I'm doing in regard to employment in America, considering what percentage of the current workforce could be automated at this stage of technological know-how, coupled with eliminating occupations that have no social return, such as Wall Street, including all jobs that have anything to do with money. As Jacques will describe, our system has no money, there's no banks, there's no cashiers. I, I have recently come to the generalized conclusion, which I'm continually working on, but I'm going to throw it out there. I believe 65% of the American jobs could be eliminated tomorrow with